and we got some newbies. Wonderful. Um, so yeah, feel free to pick up a lot of the flyers we have here for this event series for our science cafe called Science by the Pint, and for an exciting event we have coming up in a couple weeks um, called DayCon, which is a day-long conference for everybody, general public, scientists alike. We can learn a lot about planet Earth. Um, we also have some surveys here, which is your chance to give us feedback about how the lecture is going, both the organization stuff, as well as Steph's speaking and lecture style. We really appreciate your feedback, so if you could grab that now or during the intermission, um, the feedback is really useful to us. Speaking of intermission, schedule for tonight. The lecture's gonna be in two parts. Um, we'll have a 10 minute intermission in the, in the middle, and we'll have a few breaks throughout for um, Questions? <laughs> awesome. <laughs> we are also having audio issues. Um, so yeah, hold your questions until the question break. We'll make sure to leave plenty of time for that. Um, and I think that's it. Tonight's lecture is Steph, and until a few months ago, she was one of the Science of the News co-directors. So this is an exciting event for all of us. Excellent. Thanks. If you have any questions during the break or at any point, you can talk to either me, Katie, or this is great. Thanks, Katie and Dina. Um, I'm going to turn up the volume here a little bit. Um, all right. Hi, everyone, and hi to people watching on the live stream. Um, maybe that volume is a little high. Um, my name is Steph. I'm a graduate student here at Harvard in Karen Jankowski's lab where I'm working on developing lung cancer therapeutics. Um, today I'm going to talk to you a bit about my work, but also about the work broadly within the cancer research community. And I hope to show you um, and really explain uh, the challenges that we face as both researchers and clinicians in treating cancer. Um, before I get started though, I do want to have a friendly disclaimer that I am not a medical doctor. I don't play one on TV. <laughs> Even when I get my PhD and become Dr. Ware, hopefully next year, I won't really be able to provide any medical advice to anyone, but I am here today to provide you the scientist's perspective on this particular disease. Um, so cancer has been in the news a lot lately, um, primarily via this Cancer Moonshot initiative that was announced in 2016 by former President Barack Obama. It's being spearheaded by Joe Biden, and the broad goal of this initiative is to put 10 years of cancer research progress into five years. So we really want to accelerate the amount of research that's happening and basically do research smarter within the cancer research community. Um, the progress that's been made so far on this initiative um, has been pretty good so far. Um, basically, there was a blue ribbon panel that was convened in 2016 and this involved a whole group of stakeholders in the cancer research community, scientists, clinicians, pharmaceutical companies, and even patients. And these groups of people met together to decide what areas of focus the Cancer Moonshot Initiative should take uh, five years. And so I'm just gonna briefly expand on a few of these recommendations, some of the ones that I found most interesting, and some of the ones that I'll be talking about today. First, involves building a national cancer database. And so, as some of you who come to science and news lectures before may realize, um, there's a big data kind of crisis going on right now in the medical community because there's a lot of data that's being produced about all these patients, all of their tumors, but sometimes that data is being siloed into certain research institutions and not everyone has access to them. So one of the recommendations involves building this national cancer database where all this information will be in one place and easily accessible. Second is increasing patient, patient involvement in research. So patients are vitally important for cancer research. Um, they participate in clinical trials, which help us to determine whether therapies are beneficial and effective. Um, and so what we'd like to do is basically create an easier way for patients to become involved in clinical trials. And so um, creating a national registry where patients can register and pre-register for trials is another recommendation of this moonshot. Uh, third is developing new ways to overcome tumor resistance, which is something I'll expand upon during my talk. Um, additionally, something that I find uh, very near and dear to my heart is expanding the use of prevention and early detection of cancer. 
Overall, within all of these recommendations, a common theme really emerged, which was increasing cross-institutional collaboration. Basically, um, by working together, we can get things done faster. And I'll just let Joe Biden kind of introduce the talk, because he says it better than I could. The mission of this cancer moonshot is not to start another war on cancer, but to win the one President Nixon declared in 1971. At that time, we didn't have the Army organized, didn't have the military intelligence to know the enemy well, and therefore didn't have the comprehensive strategy needed to launch a successful attack. Now we do. And so today, what I'm going to talk about is, you know, what sort of intelligence we do have about cancer and how we are, we are using this intelligence to really strategize against cancer. And so the roadmap for the evening is represented here. First, I'm going to talk about the rules of the game. So basically, what is cancer? What is it doing? And how have we been battling cancer for the last 40 years? What are some of these classic playbook moves? Second, I'll talk about cancer on the offense. And for this, I'll really discuss some of the key intelligence we've gained about cancer over the past few decades. Then we'll take an intermission, and then hopefully I'll talk about something that's a little bit more hopeful, which is how we doctors, scientists, and even patients are on the defense against cancer. So first, an intro to cancer biology. Cancer affects almost everyone, probably everyone in this room knows someone who has had cancer or who has had cancer themselves. It's the leading cause, second leading cause of death in the United States. It follows heart disease um, very closely, as you can see represented in this graph. Additionally, it affects one in two men and one in three women in the United States. Now, before I go any further, I think it's important to note that when we talk about cancer, it's probably more accurate if we refer to them as cancers, because cancer is not one disease. Cancer is instead an umbrella term that really encompasses a whole host of diseases, all of their own unique characteristics. So you can define cancer by a number of different characteristics, including <clears throat> tissue type of origin, cell type of origin, the types of driver mutations, and even the specific patient characteristics. But the one thing that unites all of these cancers under this umbrella is the fact that they're characterized by uncontrolled cellular division, which is represented here in this image in which the cells on the left are more organized, um, you know, staying in place, while those on the left, uh, excuse me, right, are becoming uh, more disorganized and are growing faster. So, before I get into it and even further, I want to talk about what really underlies these changes. How are these cells growing so uncontrollably? And so, for those of you who've been to talks before, this explanation of central dogma is probably familiar, but I'll just go through it quickly. So every cell in our body contains DNA. This DNA is represented in these chromosomes shown here. And these chromosomes have these DNA strands which show different letters, different bases, that are basically an instruction manual for the cell. And so this instruction manual tells the cell um, how to create proteins, which are machines that basically perform every function within the cell. So they show the cell how to divide, how to grow, how to move, and so what the cell does is they need to read this instruction manual in order to create proteins. And so for this, um, DNA is made into another uh, type of molecule known as RNA, which acts as the messenger. This RNA is then read in order to create proteins, and proteins again are these specialized machinery. So this process of DNA going to RNA, going to proteins, is referred to as replicatory. properly. We have a very happy cell here. And this cell is going to be organized, it's going to grow when it's supposed to, and everything's going to be a-okay. Sometimes DNA becomes damaged. And this is what happens when you have basically a typo in the DNA, which is a mutation. And mutations can create proteins without normal function. So sometimes a mutation will occur just no during normal DNA replication, and there will be no effect on the resulting protein and so the cell will remain normal. But at other times, the resulting protein can actually have changes. There can be no protein produced at all, an inactive protein, or an overactive protein. And so, in these cases, your mutant DNA has produced a mutant protein, which could then lead to cancerous characteristics. And there are many different types of mutations. They're characterized by when and how they occur. So, for example, 
um, if a mutation occurs um, during development or um, basically you inherit it from your mother or father, that's called an inherited mutation. Or if you acquire it during life, that's called an acquired mutation. How it happens is also um, different depending on the type of mutation. It can happen sporadically, so if your DNA is replicating, sometimes it just makes mistakes, and those mistakes are passed on to the next cell. And sometimes it happens via environmental factors. So for example, smoking or being exposed to UV light. So for example, someone who developed skin cancer at the age of 45 would likely have mutations that are both acquired and environmental because they've been exposed to sunlight. Someone who develops blood cancer at only the age of five likely has mutations that are inherited and sporadic. And someone who develops prostate cancer at 75 might have acquired and sporadic mutations. But the thing is, it's not this simple, because it's not like one mutation always causes cancer. It generally takes more than one mutation for cancer to develop. So these cancer-causing mutations build upon each other. So this is just a simplified example here. We have a normal cell. They can have one mutation, as shown here, and this mutation will kind of make a cell that's a little different, it seems normal, but it's susceptible to developing cancer. A second mutation can come along in which it acquires more mutations, becomes a little less normal. Third mutation, the cell actually starts to grow a little faster, you can see that in the tissue over here, it's kind of becoming more disorganized. And then a fourth mutation can happen, where the cell starts to grow uncontrollably and even invade other tissues. This is just a simplified example. It's not every cancer needs four mutations. But you can see that over time, four mutations are more likely to cause a cancerous growth. <laughs> so within the cell, we have all these different signaling pathways, which are composed of proteins, those cellular machines, and they're constantly communicating with each other every day, every hour, every second. And you can see it's a fairly complicated picture here, but I'm just going to say this is actually a pretty simplified picture of what's going on within the cell. And so these signaling pathways take signals from outside of the cell and communicate them through these signaling pathways into the interior of the cell and give growth signals, for example. So we're going to zoom in a little bit on just one tiny part of the pathway, which is known as the MAPK pathway. This is an important pathway for cancer. So these little blobs here are proteins, and they're within a cell again. So recall, we have that orange membrane, and then this is inside the cell, and this is outside the cell. And so these proteins are within the signaling pathway, and they're going to communicate with each other kind of in like a telephone-style manner. So if you have a signal from outside of the cell, these proteins here are going to receive that signal and talk to RAS. And RAS is then going to communicate with BRAF and say, hey, you should tell them that they should divide. OK, so BRAF takes that signal, again, in a telephone sort of manner, and tells MEC over here, you should tell MAPK to divide. MEC communicates that as well to MAPK. And it just goes on and on down the line until you get to these final proteins here that really initiate that process of division. So the problem occurs in cancer when someone basically goes rogue. So in this example, we have BRAF. He looks kind of evil. So at this point, there's no signal coming from outside of the cell. RAF is asleep. It's not telling BRAF to do anything. But BRAF is being a shady character and deciding it needs to tell Matt K to divide anyway. And so this is a mutant BRAF protein, and the signal gets communicated downstream, even though there's no signal outside. And so this leads to uncontrolled cell division. So what we do as uh, researchers is try to figure out ways in which we can target these signaling pathways to prevent um, the uncontrolled growth. And so we do this by using drugs that specifically target different um, proteins within these pathways. And I'll come back to this later in the talk. And you can target the rapid itself, upstream proteins, or even downstream proteins. And as I mentioned before, these signaling pathways are very complicated. So again, I only showed you this very small sliver of these signaling pathways. You can see there's a lot of parallel pathways that communicate downstream at the same point as this MAPK pathway. There's also pathways that are completely separate from the MAPK pathway. And all of them are occurring at the same time. And all of them are possible to be mutated to um, produce a cancerous growth. So 
what we do as researchers is try to figure out which parts of these pathways we should target in order to shrink tumors. So what I've shown you so far is that cancer isn't one disease, but many diverse diseases. It's initiated and caused by many mutations or mistakes in DNA. Mutations can come in a number of flavors, and signaling pathways are complicated and often common targets for treatment. So with that, I can take some questions before moving on to the next part. If you guys are all cancer research experts already, though. Okay, let's keep going. All right. So here we have, um, we're basically I'm going to talk about some of those classic playbook moves that are used in the clinic to combat cancer. And so, as many of you might know, cancer starts in a primary tissue, and then over time, it can then spread to other parts of the body via the bloodstream or lymph nodes, and then end up in secondary organs where it metastasizes. And so some of the classic moves that I'm going to talk about first are those that target these local diseases, so those that have stayed within the primary tissue. So this involves surgery. This is often the first line of attack. So if you present with a tumor, um, if it's a local tumor, easily accessible, usually the first thing a doctor will do is decide to remove all the tumor and as much surrounding area as possible so that you can be sure to get rid of um, as much of the tumor and cancerous growth as possible. Second is radiation, and this is also another localized attack. So basically this uses radio waves, and you, sig you basically use these signals and attack the tumor. Um, it's basically like damaging the DNA so that the cells can't possibly divide any longer because the DNA is so damaged, and so it causes the cells to die. Um, and this is another localized attack, and it's often used in conjunction with surgery, and it shrinks tumors and prevents the tumor outgrowth. And so you can imagine that if you have a localized disease, a localized treatment works pretty well. But what happens if you present with another tumor here, another tumor there, another tumor there, more tumors there? When you have metastatic disease, you can appreciate that surgery and radiation are no longer options because you can't go in and take out all of these tumors one by one. And some of them might not even be that accessible. And so when cancer spreads, surgery and radiation become more challenging and less effective. And so that's where we get into systemic treatments. The classic one that many of you probably have heard of is chemotherapy. And so chemotherapy is a cocktail of drugs that target rapidly dividing cells. So we have a tumor cell here that has its DNA. Um, it basically usually copies its DNA and then will split up into two cells. And so what chemotherapy does is prevent cells from copying DNA, DNA and inhibit cell division so that you don't continue to divide and get new cells. And so the problem with chemotherapy, though, is that it also kills rapidly dividing cells within your body. So um, this is why people will lose their hair when they're using chemotherapy, because hair follicles are growing and dividing pretty rapidly. You'll have sometimes uh, gastrointestinal issues because your gut cells are also dividing pretty rapidly. Um, skin cells, immune cells, um, all of these can also be targeted by chemotherapy um, because chemotherapy occurs and is a systemic treatment. Okay, next thing I want to do is define the therapeutic window because this will be important once I get into talking about my work. So when we think about a particular drug, there's a number of different dosages that you can prescribe to a patient, starting from low to high. So when a drug is too low, you can imagine there will be no effect. The tumor will continue to grow. However, once you get into this effective dosage range, the tumor will begin to shrink because the dosage of the drug is sufficient to begin to shrink the tumor. But the problem is when you get too high, there's toxicity effects. So yes, you shrink the tumor, but at the same time, you're also hurting the normal cells within the body as well. And so the therapeutic grid window is a window we refer to as the dosage of the drug in which we're trying to maximize the efficacy and minimize the toxicity of the treatment. So for the classic playbook section, I talked about briefly surgery, radiation, and chemotherapy, the limitations to these strategies, and how chemotherapy is a systemic treatment that targets rapidly dividing cells, including normal ones. 
And then I've also defined a therapeutic window, which is the range of drug doses that produces the therapeutic effect without significant side effects. And so with that, I can take questions. Yes. Um, so you talked about the cancer tissue and the tissue cells divide. So that would include the tissue cells that involve why they divide that way. Yeah, that's a great question. I'll repeat it for the um, listeners on the live stream. So the question was about whether the mutant cells that I've described that are dividing are actually the tumor itself. And yes, that's correct. So the tumors that are forming within your body are when a specific cell or group of cells have begun to grow uncontrollably together. And then basically once it becomes visible to you know, the human eye or to some sort of scan of your body, that clump of cells you're seeing are those abnormal cells. Um, the thing is, oftentimes those abnormal cells aren't all the same. They're not copies of the same cell. They can be a mixture of a number of different cells with a number of different mutations. And that's something I'll talk about too later in the talk. Yes. <laughs> kind of on that same vein, I'm not really up on my cancer research. Does metastasis require an additional mutation to take place? Or are there certain mutations that result in metastasis? That's a good question. So the question is whether metastasis requires an additional mutation to take place. So whether the primary tumor cells would differ from the cells that are in the metastatic sites. Um, and that's an active area of research. So there have been examples where we can um, basically uh, sequence, which is read the DNA of tumors and their metastatic lesions within the same patients, and you can see some differences between those two groups of cells, but at this point it's still a little unclear whether or not those mutations are um, causal and definitively causing and the reason for why those cells are traveling outside the primary tissue. If you have an already existing tumor and you give a drug that is amazing at preventing cell division, will that always necessarily result in tumor reduction, tumor size reduction, or just prevent further cellular expansion? Great. So the question is, if you have a, a drug that's basically um, able to reduce um, cell division, will it always lead to tumor shrinkage? Um, and the answer is no. So um, no matter what sort of drug you have, whether it's chemotherapy or targeted therapy, um, there's a number of options. You can either stop the growth of the tumor, and the tumor can still grow, or you can even shrink the tumor. And so it really depends on the tumor itself and often the specific patient, what sort of response you'll have. Yeah. It, so, some time ago, I, I was reading about the, the DNA has some segments, like uh, oncogens or anti oncogens. Uh, what happened is when they get damaged, and there is a mutation, but regular with this mutation, that piece of the DNA is sent to the, to the, the cell to auto destruct. But when this, and this cell destruction uh, uh, segment is damaged, when the cell is going to self destruct and then it will keep on. So I don't know if that's true or not. Um, I'm not exactly sure what you're referring to, but in terms of, um, so the question was involving oncogenes and whether or not there's other self-destructive self uh, genes within the cell that maybe the cancer cell doesn't respond to and keeps growing, is that what you're But if it exists something that the cell, when it's like, uh, there's a mutation, the cell say, oh, I'm, I'm just, something's wrong with me, I would just yes. self-destruct my own cell. Yeah, so that's a great question. Um, so basically, what happens when you have oncogenes, so for example, that mutant BRAF that I showed you guys, um, the one with the evil look, that's called an oncogene. So it's a protein that's overly active. And so sometimes um, you need, so that overly active BRAF will set off alarm signals within a normal cell. And the normal cell can self-destruct and decide, you know what, I'm not gonna grow anymore. Um, however, Oftentimes, in order for cancer to develop, you need multiple mutations. So if that BRAF develops in the same cancer cell that has a mutation in that sort of self-destruct button, then the, can the cancer cell will keep growing. The cell won't self-destruct. So that's where you get into needing these multiple mutations to occur in order for cancer to happen, is because you get rid of some of those um, safety mechanisms when you have multiple mutations occurring. Yes. 
if you had a cancer and you beat it once because you had surgery and you moved to the live cells, and if you come back from the same location, would it, is it still efficient to do surgery again? Or would you pass one of the people to some radiation the second time? Yeah. So the question is if you have um, cancer, you remove it by surgery, but then it still comes up at the same location, whether or not um, it's a good idea to just do surgery again or to do additional things. So again, I'm not a doctor, so I don't know what a doctor's response to this would be, but I would imagine that you would um, do additional things like a systemic treatment, because at that point you might be concerned that the cells have already started to travel to other parts of the body, especially if you've removed a large portion of the tumor already. Okay, one more question and we'll move on. Yes. That's okay. Just one more. Um, so this is um, a great presentation and you talked about sort of some of the things that are done in response to cancer. And my question is, so you just talked all about things that we can do to in our lives to try to prevent cancer. I'll come back to that at the end of the presentation, yes. Okay. Um, talking about prevention mechanisms for cancer. Yep. Okay, so now we're going to move on to the second part of the talk, which involves cancer on the offense. And so I'll get more on the nitty gritty details about really what sort of rules cancer makes up for itself. So like I said, cancer cells play by its own rules. First rule is divide even when no growth signals are present. And so I've already shown you that in the first part of the talk. The second rule is resisting drug treatments to keep growing. And rule number three is move from organ to organ throughout the body. And so um, if any slide is important in this talk, I think this is probably the most important slide because I don't think it's as well known um, as others. But like I said, cancer is not one but many diseases. So there's all different types of cancer. Everyone knows we have liver cancer, lung cancer, um, stomach cancer. But even within one type of cancer, so even within lung cancer, there's multiple types of cancer. And so these are four different types of lung cancer, and they're all defined by the cell of origin. So each lung has a number of different cells within it that perform different functions. And depending on which cell actually becomes the cancer cell, it really defines which type of lung cancer um, is, is present within the body. And that also informs treatment decisions. But even within adenocarcinoma, there's a number of different driver mutations. So these mutations are the mutations that are responsible for the growth of these cells. And so here's just represented a few of the most well-known ones. Um, you can see BRAF here that I mentioned earlier. KRAS is a huge, important driver mutation in this particular disease. But even within driver mutations, every EGFR mutant lung adenocarcinoma is not the same. So every type of patient has their own particular additional mutations, characteristics of their body, the environment that the tumor is developed that really defines how we can begin to treat these cancers. And so the point of the slide is to show that, you know, cancer treatment is not going to be a one-size-fits-all approach. We really need to custom tailor our treatments to each particular patient. And I'll come back to this concept, which is known as precision medicine at the, uh, after the intermission. And so I've already shown you that Cancer cells will divide when no growth signals are present. And so basically the overall goal of cancer is to survive and grow at the expense of the patient's normal cells. And those diverse tumor characteristics that I just talked about are what make targeting this, these tumors particularly difficult. Rule number two is resisting drug treatments to keep growing. So what I'm going to show you now is a classic image of a melanoma patient. As you can see, this patient has systemic disease. So there's tumors all over his body, all over his chest and back. So you can appreciate that surgery and radiation is not going to be an option for this individual. However, after systemic treatment, this is only after four months, he was able to produce a really, really great response. So you can see almost all the tumors are no longer present on his body. Unfortunately, Six months later, so only two months after this great response, the tumors have returned. And you can see a lot of these tumors are in the same locations as the original tumors. And so this is known as um, tumor resistance. 
And it's a really unfortunate uh, play that cancer makes and really is one of the most frustrating parts of being a cancer researcher. And so yes, this is tumor's best play, which is resistance, which is when a tumor no longer responds to a drug to which it was originally sensitive. So just to reiterate, those tumors came back even while he was still on treatment. So he didn't get off the treatment. They still began to grow even while he was remaining on treatment. And so the easiest way to explain this is a tumor consists of a number of different types of cells. So um, the different colors here are representing different types of mutations. And so when you put the tumor onto therapy, it will begin to shrink. What I hope you can see here is that this drug killed the blue cells, but not really those gray cells. So while you actually see tumor shrinkage after initial exposure to the drug, the gray cells really aren't responding at all, such that even when the drug is still on treatment, these gray cells, now that the blue cells are out of their way, they have more nutrients, more resources, and can begin to grow. And so the tumor can come back to its original size. And the reason why this is possible is something I alluded to by answering some of your questions, is because when I talked about all this stepwise treatment from going from normal cells to cancer cells, it continues as you're developing cancer. So even when you get down here, you get the tumor cells dividing, they continue to develop additional mutations, such that the tumor cell, the tumor itself is going to consist of a number of different types of cells. And so, um, what I'm going to talk to you now about is the types of mechanisms. So how is this physically happening within the cell? Um, and so I'll recall this complicated thing here. We're going to, again, zoom back in on the NAPK pathway um, to talk about how resistance is possible. So we'll come back to our favorite mutant BRAF protein. So here, what we usually do is we can use a specific drug targeted against ERAP, and so the divide signal goes away, the tumor begins to shrink. However, what can happen is MEK, which is downstream of ERAP, can gain a mutation, which then is able to bypass this drug because, remember, this is upstream of the pathway. So at this point, MEK doesn't care what ERAP is saying. It's mutant, it's very active. So it can communicate its signal downstream and tell everyone to divide. And so even though we're treating and still inhibiting and preventing this signal from coming from BRAF, NEC is taking over. So this is known as mutation within the same pathway. Second is mutation in the parallel pathway. So as I alluded to in that um, original big cell picture, there are a number of pathways in addition to um, this MAPK pathway. One of these pathways is known as the AKT pathway. So this is parallel. It basically gets a signal from RAS as well. Uh, so RAS basically communicates with AKT and BRAF at the same time. And so um, when BRAF is turned off, AKT can get a mutation. And then this activates AKT in its downstream signal. And then it's able to communicate with those same partners that Matt K was able to communicate with and tell the cell it's time to divide. So this involves a mutation in a parallel pathway. And then third is mutation in a separate pathway. So we inhibit BRAF, we inhibit the division signal, but then we have another pathway down here that doesn't end up communicating with Matt K at all, but at the same time, it's also able to um, promote cell division. So when we get a mutation here, we get another time to divide signal. So these are three different physical ways in which we can bypass treatment on the on BRAF and have a resistance uh, phenotype. And so this can kind of be an uh, analogy for this. It's kind of like a whack-a-mole situation. So you have a tumor pop up, we bat it down with treatment, but then you know tumors pop up again across the body. We can bat it down with treatment sometimes with additional treatments. And it just goes on and on and on. And so as researchers, our goal is really to find the mechanisms of resistance and prevent its onset. And rule number three is moving from organ to organ throughout the body, which I've already talked about before. And so this process, what I want to communicate to you, is that 
moving from one organ to another is quite a complicated process. So here we have these tumor cells, and they're present in the skin, and they're going to go to the brain, which the brain is actually a common site for metastases. And so the way they do this is the tumor cells will grow within the skin and start to become quite invasive. And then this tumor cell will become so invasive that it can move and actually enter into the bloodstream, cross the vessel wall, and get into the bloodstream. When it's within the bloodstream, it can then travel through the blood, and then once it gets to another site within the body, it has to exit the bloodstream and enter this new site. And so already this process is pretty complicated. Um, we still don't really understand exactly how it happens. Um, but one thing to note as well, even when it gets to the brain, it's pretty impressive that these tumor cells are able to grow. Because remember, these tumor cells came from the skin. They're originally skin cells. They've never seen the brain before. But through mechanisms that are still unclear, they're able to establish themselves within the brain, make basically a good, comfortable environment, and then begin to grow. And that's how a metastasis forms. So what I've shown you thus far is that tumor cells break the normal rules of cell growth. They divide, survive, and invade when they shouldn't. Resistance to treatments can develop rapidly and in a number of ways. And metastasis invasion is a multi-step process. And so um, I'm happy to take some questions now before intermission, and then I'll be able to talk more about my work and what other scientists are doing to fight back against this. Yes? Uh the, the, the human being right now is, as you say, it's a big disease for the humans, the cancer, but is that across the board with other species? Like uh, I was reading about the elephant, for example, <clears throat> they have much more cells than the humans, but they, they don't have almost cancer. And but I don't know, there is a lot of uh, other living species with uh, this problem. Yeah, so the question is about um, other species and whether or not they have the same problem with cancer. And one example that he brought up was the fact that an elephant um, has a lot more cells than us, so you would think there'd be a lot more opportunities for cancer to develop, because a lot of times cancer just happens sporadically um, during DNA replication. And so in terms of uh, an elephant, um, what I do know about an elephant, it has multiple copies of a gene called P53 which is an important gene that prevents tumor growth. And so P53 is often lost in tumors because it's a preventive, it's called a tumor suppressor. So when you lose it, you can no longer suppress tumors. So elephants have a lot of copies of P53. So they have to lose a lot of P53 to even begin to develop cancer. So that's one possible explanation for why elephants don't develop cancer. There's also a number of species, I know the naked mole rat, I believe, doesn't, develop cancer and is a model organism for trying to figure out more about cancer, but I don't know much more than that. Um, but yeah, I think there are a lot of animals that don't develop cancer, and for that reason, we're studying them as humans. Naomi? Um, I don't know if you know this, but you are very nicely talked about the kind of different treatment strategies there, are like inhibiting specific proteins that when activated cause cancer. Or on the other hand, you have chemotherapy, which also you know targets cancer. And you were talking about mechanisms of resistance. And I guess my question is, is the onset of resistance timing-wise similar for the more targeted therapies for proteins as for chemotherapy, or is it different the timing of resistance? Yeah. So the question is um, regarding resistance whether or not the timing of resistance to chemotherapy is similar to the timing of resistance to targeted treatments because, I mean, because chemotherapy is often less targeted and specific. So you might think that the onset of resistance would be later. Um, I actually don't know that answer to that question. Um, but I know, do you know with chemotherapy, a lot of times the types of resistance you get are more like non-specific. So they might be a mutation that will actually start to export the drug outside of the cell, which is pretty fascinating. So um, when a drug gets into a cell that's resistant to that drug, one of the resistance mechanisms is it can actually recognize the drug when it enters the cell and export it out and just say, I don't want this anymore. 
And so that's pretty fascinating to me. And I know that's something that happens with chemotherapy. I'm not sure how common it is with targeted therapies, but we'll be talking more about the differences between those two after the intermission. Yes. Do any animals get cancer? Dogs and cats? Yes, they do. So dogs and cats do get cancer. Actually, my cousin's dog got cancer <laughs> recently, so it does happen. Yeah, so the question is about immune cell therapies, and so I can answer the question. Um, so it's about this um, girl who was in England who had leukemia, and she received basically this designer gene-edited immune cells that helped to battle cancer. And so if I recall correctly, that's, it was a CAR T transplant? I don't know. If, okay. I'm seeing nods from the other scientists in the room. Um, and so basically how that works is it can take, you can take T cells from your own body and modify them so that they're um, more potently able to attack tumor cells. So your immune system is constantly surveilling your body and trying to prevent attacks from foreign agents like pathogens, but also sometimes it can recognize cancer cells itself too and kill them before cancer develops. Um, and so one way in which you can try to combat cancer is by boosting that immune system response. And so that's basically um, what that general theme of how that treatment sort of works. So do you perceive that as a treatment for Yes, definitely. The question is whether these types of immune um, treatments will become more mainstream, and I think that's definitely true in where the trend is going. I know here in Boston, immune therapies are, are becoming much more common, and I think it'll spread um, throughout the country as well. Um, and I'll refer you guys also to a talk that was given last spring by my friend Joy, and she talks specifically about immunotherapies in cancer. Um, and so I won't be really touching on it today, but that's a great talk to get some more information about that. You can we watch also, it on our website. We also just published an article on our blog at sitinboston.com specifically on our T cell therapy and how scientists are working on expanding it for general use in medicine. So if you're curious, look it up. Yeah. Yes. Uh, on the last slide, we talked about the uh, skin cancer cell being is that that mechanism skin cells being more mainstream? Is that normal for regular skin cells? Or is that something that's just cancer cells? That's a good question. So the question was whether or not the mechanism I talked about for the cancer cells traveling into the bloodstream, if that's normal, like whether normal skin cells will do that or not. And no, it's not normal at all. So tumor cells, skin cells are meant to stay on your skin or be slowed off, as you guys may <laughs> know. Um, but otherwise, um, skin cells are very well organized. And oftentimes, and they won't be traveling throughout the body. Um, within your bloodstream, you have your blood cells, your immune cells, but you don't have skin cells or stomach skin cells or things like that traveling around. So that's why it's very rare for that to happen. Um, and so also an additional way in which we've been thinking about combating cancer is by identifying um, tumor cells once they get into the bloodstream. So there's a lot of push right now to actually create these sort of diagnostic tests where you can do a blood test and try to detect circulating tumor cells. And the hope is if you can detect circulating tumor cells, you can stop the cancer before it actually gets to that secondary site and begins to form a metastasis. Yes. When they cross into the bloodstream, do they cause internal bleeding, or is it pretty much like seamless? It's almost just. Yeah. So the question was whether or not when they cross into the bloodstream, whether there's any sort of internal bleeding that happens. And no, it's it's a pretty sleep, seamless process. It kind of just squeezes in there. <laughs> Cancer cells are very smart, <laughs> and it causes a lot of headaches for a lot of people. So, any other questions before break? 
Okay, great. So we're going to do an intermission. Um, I'll give a bit of a plug for filling out a survey because I really appreciate your feedback. It'll just be about a 10 minute break. Yep, I was going to make another plug for surveys, so great. Also, feel free to grab some snacks out there. Um, and we also have some graduate student created artwork by Science of the News members and affiliates. Um, it's available for a suggested donation. There's lots of pretty pictures that we have labored over, over microscopes and computers. So feel free to take a look at those too while you eat your snacks and enjoy the discussion. Thanks. Like, we don't want to be providing this right now. Like, 
we're going to do these self like self destructs and and say, you know, we're going to stop and sometimes they'll just not kill themselves, but they'll just stop the fighting. And so that is also a way in which you have it's the same exact process, but there are like fail safe methods in which they can sell the case and stop it and get into that case. But at the same time, most of the time, they're not trying to break all you. You still want to do this. I don't know. Yeah. So, I mean, again, I'm not a medical teacher, but yeah. I'm not a medical teacher. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. 
Um, another type of targeted therapy, again, will target these same cell signaling pathways. But you know, not all tumor cells have mutant proteins that are targeted by targeted therapy. So for example, this tumor cell doesn't have mutant BRAF. Instead, it might have a mutation somewhere downstream here, but perhaps there's not actually a type of drug that targets only that mutant protein. So for example, this tumor will have a mutation in MET here, and we use this targeted drug against MET. However, this targeted drug can target both the mutant protein and the normal protein at the same time. So here, we're killing the tumor cell, but at the same time, the same treatment will target the normal MET as well. And so we'll also be able to do some damage to our normal cells. However, the damage will likely be smaller because again, the signaling pathways that we were targeting, um, the tumor cells actually rely on them more heavily than our normal cells do. Because usually a lot of our normal cells aren't really heavily relying on MAPK pathway to keep growing and growing faster and faster. Um, so those are the two primary types of targeted therapies. And so the best part about targeted therapy is that the therapeutic window widens when compared to chemotherapy. So if you'll recall from before, we have this therapeutic window in which we're looking for an effective treatment that's not toxic. With targeted treatment, this therapeutic window widens. So at lower concentrations and dosages of the drug, we're able to actually be more effective because it's a targeted treatment. It's targeting specifically that cell signaling pathway that's important for the cancer cell. And at the same time, we're actually reducing the toxicity because our normal cells aren't dependent on those same signaling pathways. And so this is basically the gold standard of trying to develop therapies is we want to have a very wide therapeutic window so we have more of a chance of shrinking the tumor without hurting the patient. And so um, targeted therapy in practice is represented here. So if you um, are a patient that presents with a tumor, uh, oftentimes the uh, doctor will do a tumor biopsy and also take a sample of your blood. The blood will be just a point of comparison because that's going to be the normal DNA in your normal cells. And they'll sequence both of them together and compare them. And when you can compare them, you can decide what's different about this tumor cell compared to the normal cells. And with that, we can decide the most effective treatment. If we're lucky, you have a mutation in a particular protein that we already have a drug for, we put you on that drug, and things tend to work out pretty well. However, sometimes you might present with a mutation that we don't actually have a drug against. And so you have to kind of try new things. You might try immunotherapy, you might try um, some clinical trials with some new types of treatments that are available. And so this type of work is also important for the inspiration of new targeted treatments as well. And so um, we'll go back inside the cell to look at precision medicine in practice. So again, um, here's our normal signaling pathway. So with our mutant BRAF, it tells the cells to divide, and so you get a tumor forming here. And what's great about targeted therapy is we're specifically targeting that BRAF protein and shrinking the tumor without damage to the normal tissue. Um, however, not everything works out perfectly well because precision medicine in context and in reality is what's actually more difficult. So you'll recall, recall this patient I showed you before. This is actually a patient that was on a targeted therapy against the BRAF mutant um, protein. And unfortunately, their tumors came back. And again, the mechanisms of resistance I showed you, mutation, the same pathway, parallel pathway, or new pathway, are reasons why these tumors were coming back. And so um, there are a number of ways in which we as clinicians and scientists are trying to combat resistance, and one of those ways is combination therapies, which is the work that I do. And so combination treatments are great. Basically, you can combine targeted treatments together, you can combine chemotherapy with a targeted treatment, and now we're even combining targeted treatments with immunotherapies as well. And what combination treatments often do when compared to single treatments is they kill tumor cells more quickly and more potently. They can change a cytostatic effect to a cytotoxic effect. 
So this kind of comes back to a question asked earlier, in which sometimes a single treatment will stop the growth of a tumor, but it won't actually shrink it. And so with combination treatments, oftentimes you can take a, a tumor that was only slowed by one of the treatments and layer on another treatment on top of it, and that's when you actually get tumor shrinkage occurring. And then also, and perhaps most importantly, combination treatments can prevent the onset of resistance. So first, um, combination treatments potently kill tumor cells. And so again, here's kind of a representation of our favorite signaling pathway. And you can see that there's a number of parallel pathways that all feed into the downstream division signal. And so when you treat with the BRAF, sometimes that's sufficient to start to shrink the tumors, but other times it's not sufficient and the division signal still remains. And so what we do with combination treatments is we can actually layer on additional points of intervention. So we can basically um, downregulate the signal from other aspects of the signaling pathways. And so you have a much um, more potent response in which the signal is severely dampened and then you can see um, tumor shrinkage occurring. And now I'm going to talk about converting um, a response from cytostatic to cytotoxic. And so I'll specifically talk about one experiment that I did in the lab. Um, and so this is a mouse experiment. And so this is known as a mouse model of cancer. And so what I did is I took a plate of mouse cancer cells and I injected these mouse cancer cells into the tail vein of the mouse. And so when you do that, the cells actually travel through the tail veins, this is within the circulation, these tumor cells are in the circulation of the mouse, and they travel straight to the lungs. And when they're in the lungs, they're able to establish themselves there. It's very easy for these cells to establish in the lungs because this is a lung cancer mouse cell line. So they're used to that lung environment. And so they establish within the lungs. And because these are cells that I have created myself, I can infect them with luciferase, which is this glowing protein. So after two to three weeks, I actually see glowing signal within the lungs. And then I can divide the mice into four primary groups. One group that has no treatment, one group that has treatment with drug A and drug B, and one, treat, one group that has treatment with both of the drugs together. And then because the tumors are glowing, I can actually track the tumor growth over time, which is pretty cool. And so I'm gonna show you some data now. So this is a mouse that was, again, injected through its tail vein with this um, lung, mouse lung cancer cell line. And so at day zero, we have this signal here, which represents the lung tumor that started to develop. And this is no treatment. So by day 10, this mouse is very sick, has very large tumors within its lungs. And this is also represented here in this um, slide. So basically, once the mouse gets to this day 10, I harvest the lung from the mouse and then cut it up into very, very thin sections and put it onto a slide. And so this is what's represented here, which is basically a slice of the lung. And so this dark purple stain right here represents the tumors. So you can see the vast majority of the lung is tumors. Um, this kind of spongy part right here, the lighter purple, is the lung, the normal lung. So you can see what this is what we refer to as a very high tumor burden. So most of the lung is tumor at this point. And again, this mouse was very sick after 10 days. So when you look at drug A and drug B, you can see again, the lung, the lung tumor is established here at day zero. But then I put it on drug A and B, and it still continues to grow, but the growth is not as severe as it was with no treatment. And you can see that again represented here where we have smaller tumors um, within, the tumor, within the lung. And then lastly, we have the combination treatment, which again establishes at day zero, but the difference between combo and all the rest is that this tumor has actually started to shrink as compared to day zero. So this represents and shows you the really large benefit of combination treatments. Um, additionally, combination treatments are able to prevent the um, resistance mechanisms that I showed you before. So you'll recall that we have the single target treatment. You put the drug on, 
you start to shrink the tumor. However, the purple cells are not being shrunk because they're resistant to the treatment. And so then they're able to outgrow and the tumor comes back. The idea with combination treatment is that now you're targeting two separate proteins. So the hope is that you'd be able to actually start to shrink the tumor and shrink more of the cells, including those, those like resistant purple cells as before, because now you're targeting more pathways and more proteins. So you're more likely to be able to shrink more of the tumor. And so the hope is that you would then become cancer-free at this point, and you wouldn't get this outgrowth of resistance. Um, and so if any of this sort of uh, concepts sound interesting to you, I also suggest coming out to one of our talks, the last talk of the series, which is going to be talking about antibiotic resistance, because we use kind of some of these similar concepts where we're trying to complex a number of combination treatments together in order to prevent the outgrowth of resistance. And then I'll also talk a little bit more about what the effect of the therapeutic window is on combination of combination treatment. So we have a single targeted treatment shown here. And here's the combination treatment. So you can see basically the therapeutic window shifts slightly. So at lower dosages of the drug, when you're using it with another drug, you're able to show an efficacious response. However, the problem is that the toxicity um, actually increases at higher dosages of the drug because now you're targeting two separate parts of the pathway at the same time. So normal cells aren't able to really compensate for the fact that you're being, it's being targeted at two separate parts of the pathway. And so that means that the toxicity um, really increases here. And then also resistance can and does still emerge even with combination treatment. Um, and so a lot of the work going on right now with combination treatments is thinking about how to rationally design these treatments to prevent resistance, how to combine more than just two drugs together, um, how to combine it with immunotherapies. Um, so it's a really large area of research right now. And then um, lastly, again, not much is really known about metastases, um, but what I can say is, like I showed you before, it's a very long, complicated process, and there's, there's work being done to figure out how you stop the cells from getting invasive in the first place, how to stop cells when they're crossing into the blood um, blood vessel, like is there a way, what sort of proteins are important for crossing into a blood vessel, and then can we target those proteins, um, and then also what sort of proteins are important for getting out of the blood vessel, can we target those proteins, what proteins are important for establishing in these new tissues, can we target those, um, but these are still very active areas of investigation and not much is known, unfortunately. But what is known is that signaling pathways are important, so we're basically trying to combat different types of signaling pathways and use mouse models to determine um, how we can prevent metastasis. Because as I mentioned to someone on your mission, metastasis is actually responsible for 90% of cancer deaths. So most people who die from cancer are people that die from metastatic disease. So what I've shown you, in this small part, and then I'll go a little bit into prevention, is that targeted treatments shift the therapeutic window for the patient's benefit. Combination treatments can shrink tumors, prevent resistance, and target multiple pathways. And researchers are still searching for multiple ways to target metastasis. Um, and with that, we can take any questions. Yeah. Um, so the question was using combination treatments kind of seems like a no-brainer. So how long has it been used? Why why would you even use single treatments in the first place? Why wouldn't you do combination treatments? And so um, the thing is target therapies have only really been around for maybe a little over a decade at this point. Um, and when we were first discovering targeted therapies, there's a therapy known as Levac, which was kind of this miracle drug. It targeted a specific protein, the tumors just melted away, and they actually didn't come back. And so everyone thought, okay, you know, we identify the mutant protein, we get a drug against it, and everything's gonna be great. 
Um, and that was the thinking when we developed the BRAF mutant drug as well. And then it kind of shocked everyone when someone who was supposedly cured came back just two months later and looked the same. So this process, um, I'm glad it seems obvious, but I think the process of getting to combination treatments um, was a little circuitous because we kind of got a little cocky, I think, because people thought with um, the advent of genetic sequencing, it would be really easy to just identify this is the one protein that's important for developing this particular tumor. But the reality is um, not only does resistance emerge, but tumors consist of cells that have all different types of mutations. And so um, just having one targeted treatment is not going to be enough. Um, and so we've only now just begun to appreciate what's referred to as the heterogeneity of tumors, which is the fact that there's a number of different types of cells in each tumor. I will say that I think it's a testament to your talk that it seems very <laughs> obvious that combination. <laughs> but I'm curious, like your personal opinion, where you think the bottleneck is with this kind of stuff. Like, if you had a bunch more time to spend, would you try and develop new targeted treatments or try all the potential combinations? Like, what is more useful spending time? On? That's a good question. So the question is, what the bottleneck is with all this? Um, whether our time is better spent in developing new types of targeted treatments against new proteins, or whether it's better spent in developing new types of combinations? Um, it's a good question. Uh, the problem is, hmm, it's a hard question to answer. I guess personally, um, what I find, this is kind of avoiding the question, but what I find most interesting is um, with combination therapies, the fact that um, right now there's been a lot of work in thinking about whether we need to use two drugs at the same time continuously, or whether you could use one drug for a certain period of time, and then another drug for another period of time, and then another drug, and do it sequentially, and what, what effects that has. So I think that's a really interesting area of focus because that also could prevent some of those toxicity problems that I was talking about if you can use drugs at different times and kind of give what they call drug holidays is another concept where you might give the drug for a little bit, take them off for a week, Get them again. Um, the problem with developing new targeted treatments for new proteins is the fact that you know we've been sequencing tumors now for a decent amount of time, and I'm not really sure how many new proteins are going to be available um, for targeted treatments. Though there are undruggable proteins at this time, so that RAS, the one that's targeting and talking to BRA, is. Um, I can't say that word, is a really hard problem <laughs> um, to combat. And so um, we can't target it. And so because of that, we've been trying to target it with combination treatments by basically targeting its downstream players and upstream players because we can't target grass itself. So I don't know if I really answered the question, but there's a lot to talk about. Um, so you mentioned that combination therapies can be really great. Are there are number of combination therapies that work for a number of proteins, but like each protein can have like a specific kind of like walking be a specific combination that would need to apply to it. That's a good question. So with targeted therapies, the question was um, whether or not different combination treatments would have like multiple or targeted treatments would target multiple proteins or just targets one protein like a lock and key. And actually, there's a lot of drugs which people refer to as dirty drugs that have multiple targets. And so um, most of the time we'll be kind of um, within the research community um, talked about as like this is a drug against MEK, but then we find out a little bit later that actually it also targets these, this list of other proteins, maybe not as potently, but it also targets them at the same time. And then people try to deconstruct whether or not the responses they're seeing is just because it's inhibiting MEK or if it's also inhibiting all those other proteins as well. And so that's a really important area of research now. And the thought is too, like maybe dirty drugs work better because they're targeting multiple proteins at one time. So maybe you should use one drug that targets many proteins instead of multiple drugs that target many proteins. So I have a question. Combination treatment is really not a novel idea in a sense. Because what we refer to common for chemotherapy is often the combination of five agents. So we've been trying to play the card for a long time, and I'm 
big complication has been once you have enough agents, how do you test in clinic like a combination of those? Yeah. And so how do you think like we we try to like address the issue once we have enough like possible theoretical combination you can use agents? Right. Um, so the question is, um, when you're using combination treatments, you know, there's a lot of different combinations you can try. How do we actually get it into the clinic? Like, it's probably not realistic to think that we're going to be able to try every single combination possible in like a randomized control trial, for example. Um, it's a really good question. Um, a lot of work right now has been on um, doing patient-derived xenografts, which is un so what those are is basically you take part of the tumor from a patient and then you can implant them into mice. So instead of doing what I showed you before, you can actually, instead of using mouse cancer cells, you can do human cancer cells and put them into mice. It's unclear whether or not that's very representative of the response you might see in that particular patient. Um, so, yeah. The question really relies on thinking about how we can get some of these processes of testing things in vivo in mice to happen faster. Because if a patient presents with a tumor and you're unsure whether it's going to respond to a particular targeted treatment, um, you can't, it's not fast enough to put it in a mouse to try it out and then give the patient that tumor. So a lot of work kind of needs to be done on the technological side of things to think about how to speed up that process. Yeah. Uh, well, thinking about that is any kind of ongoing project using artificial intelligence trying to put a computer to analyze somehow and, and find that uh, the computer make like a calculation which is going to be the best uh, cocktail of drugs to give to the, to the people or something like that? Or? Yeah, so the question is about artificial intelligence and whether we can utilize those types of technologies to better predict responses. And that's a really good point. So a lot of um, people even at Harvard do modeling of signaling pathways, and they can try to predict with their models, these are computer models, um, whether or not uh, a particular signal will be dampened strongly if you inhibit it at this point versus this point or these points at the same time. So that's definitely something that's being worked on right now. In terms of artificial intelligence, I know there's a number of companies that are using systems to read through, you know, swaths of literature, reading through literature much faster than I could read through literature and figuring out um, whether or not there's different points of combinations that we can try that maybe we haven't thought of. Um, and so those are definitely in development. Um, I think more so on the industry side of things um, than the academic side of things. Okay, last question. So we know if you inject these you know, tumor cells into mice and not multiple proteins, but what about the No. So the question is whether or not if you inject tumor cells into an organism that normally doesn't develop cancer, whether they'll grow or not. So like injecting those tumor cells into a naked mole rat, for example. I'm not sure. I would I would think they would be able to establish, but um, I'm not positive. I'm sure that work has probably been done. Okay, and I just have a few more slides to finish up the talk. Um, and so I hope what I've shown you in my talk so far is that um, you know local disease is easier to control, but once you get metastatic disease that's more systemic, it's harder to treat. Um, it becomes much more difficult. And so the question becomes, can we stop cancer before it starts? And the reason why this is important is for a number of reasons. Like I showed you, um, when you expose a tumor to drugs, there's a number of options. It can continue to grow, the growth can slow, it can start to shrink, but then it can also come back. And so the best option, and it sounds very obvious, but the best option for not getting, dying from cancer is to not get cancer at all. Um, and this is where cancer prevention comes in. And this is important not just for the patient health, but also if you think about costs, the targeted treatments I've shown you thus far are very expensive. So if you have a populace that is not getting cancer as often, 
the cost for the healthcare system is going to be astronomically lower than um, if they're all being treated with heart food treatments. Um, additionally, a recent paper a few years ago from Harvard showed that over half of cancer-related deaths may be prevented by lifestyle changes. And so this study was really interesting. They took a group of 100,000 patients, or people, sorry. It was basically a um, cohort study. So they had all of these people. They tracked over years and years, decades and decades. And they had a lot of information about them. They knew whether they smoked, they knew their BMI, they knew if they exercised regularly. And what they could do is divide these patients and people into two types of groups, a high-risk group and a low-risk group. And then they looked back retroactively to see whether the high-risk group developed cancer more often than the low-risk group. Yes, indeed, they did. And so um, based upon this study, they were able to estimate that half of cancer-related deaths could be prevented. This is really interesting, but the problem is, um, if you look at the National Cancer Institute budget, only 4% of the budget goes to research for prevention and early detection. A lot of the reason for this is kind of obvious. Um, there's not a lot of money to be made in prevention and research um, about early detection. And so perhaps because of that, that there's not as much research going on. Oh, I was going to ask you what sort of prevention mechanisms there are, but I already showed you it. But anyways, here's some of the classic prevention strategies. I'm sure all of you probably thought about these before, um, including reducing your UV light exposure, your alcohol intake, not smoking. Um, something that's also really interesting is the fact that pathogens are actually a major source of a number of cancers. So for example, HPV, 90% of HPV cases are, oh sorry, cervical cancer. 90% of cervical cancer cases are caused by HPV. And so um, there's a vaccine against HPV, which is recommended for um, boys and girls um, starting at age 9 or up to 11. And so this HPV vaccine actually prevents HPV and then also um, prevents cancer down the line. So um, that's a really important prevention strategy. And surprisingly, the rate of um, HPV vaccination in the United States is only 33%. So this is a really easy way in which we can increase the amount of HPV vaccination in order to decrease the amount of cervical cancer later in life. And another interesting part of prevention is this concept of precision prevention. So I already talked to you about precision medicine. Um, this involves having cancer being detected within the patient. You identify a cancer-causing mutation and hopefully are able to um, prescribe a precision drug, which can lead to a number of responses in the tumor. Precision prevention utilizes a lot of these same strategies but with the hope of stopping cancer before it starts. So in this particular model, we have a patient that has a family history of cancer, and so they can then have their genome sequenced and determine whether they have a cancer predisposing mutation. And so this is a mutation that will be present within their cells. Kind of think of that tree I showed you earlier. So it's basically one of those mutations that will kind of bring that cell down lower in the tree, make them more easily predisposed to developing cancer later in life. And so if you have a cancer predisposed mutation, this might encourage your doctor to help you develop an action plan, which involves more frequent screenings, a healthier lifestyle, and then hopefully with that sort of intervention, you can stop cancer before it starts. And so I think this is a really interesting um, idea that's kind of gaining traction right now. Um, one of the most common things people think of when they think of precision prevention is Angelina Jolie. So when she was able to detect that BRCA1 mutation, which predisposed her to breast cancer, she had a double mastectomy, um, even before even developing cancer. And so that was a pretty radical decision, but it was definitely a way in which she could stop cancer from happening before it started. And another thing I think is interesting is thinking about the fact if someone detects a predisposing mutation um, within their body, perhaps that would be more of a motivation for them to stop smoking, for example. 
So I think there's a lot of ways in which precision prevention could be utilized um, to really uh, affect cancer at the population level. And if you're interested to learn more in precision prevention, I wrote an article about it at SITMBoston.com. There's also a lot of really great articles up there by all of my classmates. And then I just want to briefly define a few MVPs and rising stars. So I already mentioned immunotherapy is a really hot topic. Um, it's looking quite promising. Um, and we have an entire talk on our website about it from last year. So definitely check out our archives. Also want to give a quick shout out to Joy who gave that talk because she's the one that designed all the really cute um, uh, little figures I've been using throughout the talk. Um, also um, molecular diagnostics. So I also mentioned this in response to a question. Detecting cancer early is a really important thing to do. And one of those ways that scientists have been thinking about it is developing new technologies like detecting circulating tumor cells within the blood and hoping that we can use that sort of diagnostic to prevent the growth of metastases later on. And then also the idea of patient-derived xenografts, which I also talked about. You guys are really good at like getting to talk about these things early. But basically taking tumors from patients, putting them into mice, and then determining how they respond to treatments. And the really exciting part of this, if the technology can get fast enough, is this idea of avatar clinical trials. So basically, if you present with a tumor, being able to take part of your tumor, quickly grow it up in a mouse, test a bunch of therapies against it, and then decide which ones the tumor responds to, and specifically tailor your treatment regimen to yourself and to your tumor. And so I just want to end with a quick note that um, we're talking here a lot about this cancer moonshot, but I hope you can appreciate that it's a little bit different than the moonshot, uh, the original moonshot, because here we have a lot of different moons. It's a lot of patients, a lot of individual um, challenges that we have to face, but we have a lot of great people and good technologies working against it. And so I think now more than ever, it's really important to support cancer research and research um, generally. So with that, I just want to thank everybody who helped me out with this, especially those who helped me with the graphics and slides. I also want to thank all of you who are taxpayers that support this work. And thank you, and have a great night. It sounded like certain cultures may have different lifestyles. And yeah, yeah. So the question is whether there's um, evidence for different um, incidences of cancer across the world, depending on different regions, different lifestyles. And that's definitely the case um, when it comes to uh, different types of cancer types. So an easy example of this is skin cancer happens more often in Australia because it's always sunny there. I don't know why we're not there right now, but it's always sunny there. And so those patients or people there tend to get skin cancer more often because they're exposed to more UV light. Um, other examples are, um, you know, we have a Western diet. So there's more evidence now that certain types of food that we eat in our Western diet will predispose us more to, to, to stomach cancers and other types of internal gastrointestinal cancers. Um, and then another interesting fact, too, is that lung cancer occurs um, really often in women in Asian countries because they're often in um, kitchens that are poorly ventilated. Um, and so, for example, in China, there's a really high incidence of um, lung cancer happening in women. Not because of smoking? No. So that's the thing that's particularly interesting is that in the United States, only 10% of lung cancers are in non-smokers in the world it's 25% of lung cancers are in non-smokers because of things like poor ventilation and also because of really high pollution in some of those regions as well. Yes. Yeah, about exposure to sun in Australia, skin cancer 
about like in Caribbean islands? I mean, where they have sled all the time. Is there more skin cancer down there? Yeah, so I mean, you also, so when you're thinking about the night, the interesting thing about cancer, the question was whether or not there's more um, types of skin cancer in like areas like the Caribbean islands, for example, as it compared to um, Australia. And so the thing that's really interesting about cancer is it's a combination of genetic as well as environmental factors. So people in the Caribbean might be less um, likely to develop cancer because they have more melanin in their skin or just different parts of their um, biology uh, make it so that they're not as likely to develop skin cancer um, as people in Australia. So it's a combination of the environment and plus genetic factors as well. What about like Florida? You know, mm -hmm. people in Florida are exposed or like Seattle or something. Yeah. yeah. Do you see any changes? Um, I'm not familiar. I'm sure there have been studies with that um, about the regional differences within the United States. Um, but yeah, that's a good question. Okay, well, great. I'll be up here if anyone has some more questions as well. Thank you. If you have any surveys, you can just put them up here and we'll grab them on our way up. Thank you.